All right, so first of all, so far, we're gonna move on to the little bit more advanced topics. Uh, UIs were very important, but those are very basic, okay? Um, it's mostly about Googling the details, parameters, and then try to see which one works best for you. And then after that, you will need to put the data, uh, show the content, all of those. And we're gonna get you started on that direction. But before we move on, um, any, any questions or uh, challenges or problems you're having that you don't know where to start? Uh -huh. It's like updating values in Oh, okay, okay. So we will talk that maybe next week. Um, but I think you just need to use the Firebase SDK. Have you set up that? Oh, yeah. They have the Flutter SDK, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll probably look at that next week. Okay. Sorry, you're asking the push notification? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there, did you follow some of the tutorials? Yeah, the thing you need to. Oh, you were talking about developer account, right? I can uh, stop by after this class. I can add you to my Apple account. I have an enterprise account. So that might help. Okay. Uh, but for the push notification, I'm pretty sure Flutter has something to support. Uh, but also, if you use something like Firebase, it might simplify a lot of things. So uh, in the past, you had to do native setup for both platforms. And then some of the things I see like Firebase, they can unify the two. And make it really simple. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. Okay, yeah. I can, uh, for whoever need to do some LOS development or testing, you need an account. If you don't want to pay that $100 per year, uh, you can ask me. I can add you to another account that you can use. All right. Any other uh, questions, thoughts? All right, that's good. So those questions show that you guys are actually pretty good on UI and then you're dealing with the data with uh, some of the special features. If you haven't started UI, haven't started your app, you gotta speed up. Okay, so this is the end of week five. Um, even though we have 10 more weeks, but we will probably need to have around three weeks. Okay, probably two to three weeks for a demo, for a summary, all of those. So we're not gonna start a demo on the week 15. Okay, so very likely we'll start a demo on, on week 12 or 13, all right, so there is also spring break, and then you need to put your app into the store, okay, by, by the time you do the demo. Uh, so really the time you have for development probably is another four or five weeks. And also the truth is after five or four weeks, you will have more midterms, and then things will get busy. So we just present demo to Yes, live demo, so, so for the, yes. So for this demo, Okay, so we're not gonna ask everyone to do a slide. Okay, it's, a, it's just 80 projects, so there are no time for slides. So what we did before, I think that works, is uh, you know they have this uh, kind of a uh, projector here, this, this thing, okay? Just put your phone uh, under this camera and that is gonna project. That's the easiest way to demo it. Uh, of course, if you don't have a phone, you can always use your laptop to run the emulator, okay? But the phone will be the best. That's the easiest way. Live demo, okay, we're only interested in live demos. <clears throat> the things that can read. Okay. One more interesting, okay. I got this email last yesterday. I haven't. Uh... So that's another cool thing about the, about the, uh... let me, let me open this email. Okay, guys. This one. This evening I got this long email. I thought it was a uh, spam. And then, it turned out, I don't know if you guys can read it, okay? It turned out that this guy from Denver, uh, oh, actually, no, from Long Beach, um, but living here in Denver, okay? So, uh, so he anyway, he is trying to make this app something about uh, traffic, mobile traffic re relief app. And then they, he, he said, oh, okay, I, I actually, we, we have the startup called Weird Out. And, um, we actually found out you actually have this, uh, <laughs> this app published in Google Play, blah, blah, blah. He said, oh, you know, you know I, I clear I didn't really check this one. I should have this name, um, all of this. But basically, you know, he said so much. He want to have a conversation with us, actually with me, because he saw that's, that's, that was my app. And then 
obviously want to talk about some of the collaboration, but the most important thing I think he want to talk about is the naming. So it's actually you know, somewhere here. Okay, so anyway, he was talking about this one. So what is it with all? Okay, let me open this uh, Google Play. So um, it's, it's an app did by, um, let me first open it here. If you do Google Play, we're all, okay. It's actually this one here, we publish, okay. Very simple app, I, I can't remember what this one does, okay. So this one gives you this Cal Poly, um, I can't remember that what they do. So they gave you uh, allow user to save locations that visit very often and simply provide them with weather. The, oh, just the driving condition and the weather condition, something like that. Okay, very simple. I, I guess the problem we're trying to solve is uh, rather than go to the Google Map to see this thing, um, click on that again, and again every day. This one open app it shows all this basic information you care about, right? Some location you commute to drive very often. This one was published in 2017, spring, okay? Uh, a little bit more than five downloads. And then, you know, the student put my name, but this is not my app, okay? But it's under the uh, account we have for the whole class. So it's actually, let's actually find it out. And then launch the console. All right, so let's find out that app. Right here. Okay. The interesting thing, as you can see, um, a lot of this app got to be removed. I, I explained the reason they were removed because this this one's updated so early. Then every once in a while, Google will update their privacy agreement or whatever agreement. Right? You got to update and agree, agree, agree. If you don't click on the grid, then they're gonna remove it, and then you can't have your app at a life. Obviously, most of the students don't really care. They they're done with the class. They they they're gone, and then. Looks like this this app. I, I I was trying to find out the, who did it. I can't find it. Um, it was in one of the forms. But anyway, I'm pretty sure it's been already graduated. Okay. Uh, but you know this one doesn't have a lot of the downloads. Um, however, this email actually shows a lot of the things. Okay, that's kind of the power of having those things published. Okay, so I, I I'm not really seeing how. Uh, also, I I have to tell you this is our second time we got this one. Okay, the first time was. Uh, the brothers, they did this um, app for the campus right. It's called the campus right. Um, you know, it's basically the same idea that you exchange a right with a par parking spot. Uh, they made an app and then, uh, interestingly, they have a domain name. I think it's called uh, campus right app, something like this, okay. Um, let, let, me, let me try to find it. So we used to have this domain name, but maybe they, they shut it down. But the domain name was the campus right or get campus right.com or campus right app.com. I, I, I can't remember. And also, same thing a group emailed us, oh, we're making this app. You know, would you be interested you know, to sell this domain name to us? And then this guy here is trying to basically have this conversation. Um, to be honest, okay, this is really not important. This is not a domain name, it's only just a a app, you know, in the store, and, and then he can just uh, publish another one with slightly different, or I don't know if you can have the same name, maybe you can even have the same name, uh, I don't know. So, um, not really a big deal, but if you have this conversation, you can definitely request something, okay. I, I don't think this one can um, sell the, uh, you, can, you can sell this one for a lot of money, but if you ask for a couple of hundred dollars, or maybe thousand dollars. I think it's very, very likely. Okay, because this name I can definitely see it's a pretty good name. Okay, that's what our student did. The other one, the the uh, what's it called? The campus red. I think that he offered about one thousand dollars to buy the domain name. Uh, that's that's the other one. But then they didn't sell it. Uh, the brother now is in Google and Apple. They really don't care about that one thousand um, dollars. But uh, something really happened yesterday. Okay, um, you know if you publish your thing. People are gonna see it. You find it out. You you always have this kind of opportunities, all right. And then um, you may also have some kind of a collaboration with them, right? So if you guys are working on the same thing, so um, don't don't underestimate of putting this into the school. Okay. Otherwise, it sits in your computer. 
it pretty much don't have any impact, all right? Okay, so. All right, so uh, after the UI, uh, you need to look at how you deal with the server, with the internet connections. Because today, if you look at all the apps, it must be connected with some kind of server or backend. Um, it's very rare to see a standalone app that doesn't need internet. There are, for example, a calculator app that doesn't need internet. It's very easy for use, and it's a utility app. As long as you're doing something about social, about communication, about users, and then most likely you will need to have a backend. Um, also think about the most typical app, like Gmail, right? So all your emails are in Google server. Now you download the uh, Gmail app, it will just load all the emails from the server, and then you can also create emails, send emails, delete emails. All of those will be synchronized to your server. All right, so your app is only a friend then. And same for other apps, okay? Social media, app, Facebook, Instagram, same thing. All those photos and messages are posted and saved in the server. The app is just kind of a client a window for you to, to interact with all this content, all right? So that's why you really need to know how to make your app to communicate with the backend servers. Right. Um, for those of you who have done 4D class last semester, okay, so you already should have some kind of background with this. Whenever we talk about the backend communication, and then you need the network, you need the internet. And when you need the internet, there are different ways to do the communication, different protocols. And the most popular and the most commonly used protocol is HTTP protocol. Um, for mobile, particularly, the same thing. Most mobile apps are using HTTP except some of the big companies like, like Google, I know they have some of the thing called a protocol buffer. Uh, it's their own kind of a communication protocol. You can also use that, but you know, HTTP is a more common. And then it's, a, it's widely supported by most of the backend and APIs. So um, you need to really <coughs> understand how HTTP works and then how do you use HTTP to communicate with server from the mobile devices. A lot of you already did this one in 4D project. Uh, you know how to do that through JavaScript, through HTML. Now you just need to know how to do that using Dart and for the Flutter apps, all right? So some of the very quick reviews, right? HTTP, this is the protocol. Uh, the protocol itself has a lot of details, okay? If you look at the specification, it has hundreds of pages. But the most important thing you need to understand is uh, some of the, how the sequence works, what are the request and the response format? What are the attributes you normally need? What are the HTTP methods? And also the URL format, some of these key things you need to know. It's uh, not a lot, right? So this is a very simple example, okay? Uh, a very old browser, okay? This is the IE, IE4 browser. I don't know how many of you actually use this one. Um, I actually used that one. That time, the IE was very, very popular. Because the IE, actually, Microsoft paid a lot of the panel. I don't know if you know any of this news. So, you know, the, when the internet become very popular, then, uh, Microsoft built this broader called IE, and it's built in um, in the Windows. So whoever using Windows basically will have that broader automatically, rather than some other broader like Netscape. Some of those you have to download it, just like Chrome or or you know the Firefox. You have to download it separately. So a lot of these companies sue Microsoft that you you do the you're doing the monopoly. Okay, so you're you're basically controlling the market. Basic basic everyone using Windows, everyone using IE. Because of that, they, they almost split the Microsoft into two. But eventually, I think he, they paid a lot of penalty, a huge number of money, okay? So that's, that was the story. Um, so you go to the URL, and then you see this page. Now, what happens from the internet point of view is you, you type the URL, and then you're sending this request to the server, to whatever uh, web server you're talking to, okay? And then you're sending that through HTTP request uh, protocol, so there's a specific format you have to follow in terms of uh, where you send it, the address, the parameters, what you're requesting. And then the server will give you an HTTP response, uh, which contains all the HTML code. And then the browser got the code and then we'll render it in the browser. That's what you see on the web pages. But underlying, there are a lot of HTTP uh, communications going on, right? So today, if you look at um, you know, the browser, all of this, okay, if you open this uh, Chrome, um, developer two, okay, if you go to this network here, okay, like this page right now we're seeing, if I try to refresh it, you can see all the communication going on. So if I'm gonna re refresh the page, 
as you can see, all of these things going on are HTTP requests. So they start with building, loading this home page, which is HTML page. And then the page has a lot of other things, has uh, images, has icons, and then they need to make API calls to get the user information, the app information. So all of these are HTTP calls, okay? So every time we will see a page, there, there, there are quite a lot of communication going on in the background, all right? So they also follow HTTP. So that's basically what the product is used for. Here, give you an example on what's contained in each of the request and response. Okay, so every request will have a header, will have a request line that specifies the method, specify the URL you are requesting, and also some of the headers. The header will include um, some information about this client, what kind of OS you are using, what kind of broader you are using. And on the other hand, the response will give you the response code, which indicates the status of the response, whether it's successful or not. It has some of the headers, how much data being sent it back, what is the type, it's the image, it's the text, all of those. All right, so some of the things, details, okay, we talk about this also in 4AD. Number one, you need to know when you do a HTTP request, what is the method you are using? Okay, so there are eight different HTTP methods you can choose, but the most uh, commonly used methods are get and the post, right? Get simply means that you want to read some information, you want to get some information from the server just to fetch the information without changing it. When you do post, that means you're trying to you know, modify some information. For example, if when you log in, right, you, you pass your password and username, you send it to the server, the server will verify it. So this is a typical get request because you're not changing anything, you're just sending the information to be used you know, by the server side. Or uh, if you try to search for the classes from Bronco Scheduler, right, uh, from the uh, Bronco Direct, so that's also a GET request. You're trying to search, query. But on the other hand, if you are registering a course, if you're changing your password, if, you're, if you are signing up your account, most likely you're doing the POST request because you are giving the information, the information will be used to save on the server side, will be used to modify the information on the server side. So those are called POST. Sometimes you start to see delete, very easy. You, if you want to delete some record, you can use the delete method. Sometimes you see put, which is sometimes used in like creating a new, brand new record. Um, but those are not very common. So if you see some API or servers are called REST API or RESTful API, if they're really following the REST standards, then you will see they use different methods. But you know, not all the server APIs are 100% confirmed to the REST API standard. So the get and post are the most commonly used ones. All right, so you need to know this concept because later on when you program, you will actually need to choose a different method. Another thing you need to know is the URL. This is pretty easy. Okay, so we're using this every day. But some of the little details, well, number one is uh, right after the URL, the domain name, you normally have a port number. Okay, so I mean, most time we don't put the port number because the port number is 80 by default and then we don't have the right 80. But if you do have to request some other port, from a different server that you have to put that support number. And then slash, um, you will have the pass. Um, the pass can be having different levels. And then also you can pass on the parameters. Sometimes you pass the parameters just in the URL. Sometimes you put the parameter in the, in the request body. So depending on what the re uh, API requires, okay? Uh, so that's the URL, how that works. And then for the response, once you got a response, you will uh, you know, see all the status, you will see the length, those are the important information, um, but also the actual response code or content will be attached to the end. If you're requesting HTML page, you will see all the HTML code there. If you're just getting some kind of uh, API data, most likely you will see something on the JSON, JSON format data. Uh, so we'll see some examples, all right? So uh, to really play around with HTTP requests, you have all the different tools. You have some of the command line tool called um, curl. You also have the Chrome developer tool I mentioned. You can also do uh, this Postman app, very popular. A lot of you probably used that before. It allows you to test some of the things, okay? So let me just show you some examples, all right? So uh, again, let's go back and then see, uh, like if you go to cpp.edu, for example. All right, so this is a HTML page. Then if you want to see, um, if you want to see here uh, for the request, so if I refresh this again, all right, so we're fetching a lot of uh, um, uh, 
data from the website. The first request is www.cfp.edu. And then if you click on this one, you can see uh, the, the header from your request. So that's the things we're sending from here. And then some of the important thing is this, uh, the URL. Okay, so this very first one. So that request specified which part of a content you are requesting. And then the HTTP method called a get. The return status 200, that means successful. And then if you wanna see the actual response, what's being contained, if you click on this one here, that shows you the response body which has the HTML code for this web page. Okay, so this content is the same as the one you see from here. If you do right click on the view page source, Okay, so that shows you the HTML page for the home page, but those are things you fetch from the Cal Poly server, okay, using HTTP requests. All right, so that's how you can see all this process going on. And then if this is, uh, for example, a CSS file, same thing, so you can see this is CSS you get from the server. You might get images, and this is the image, and the same thing that you got. Uh, it doesn't show you, but it's just basically a bunch of data from that page. You could also uh, do the request through other tools, right? So if I go here uh, to the terminal, I told you about this command called curl. If I do this one, I do it HTTP. If I do this one, I'm also sending the get request, right? So if I do this, um, okay, it's giving me a 301, which means, uh, it's a, it's a cache, okay? So what's, how can I, how can I avoid that? Let me just try something else, okay? Not CPP, but maybe do Google. All right, so if I do that, as you can see, it gives me all this uh, HTML code, a lot of JavaScript, that's the Google homepage, right? Um, what I see here is the actual response from Google server but you can't see the Google website because it's a terminal, the terminal doesn't know how to parse and then handle it. Hey, no. the, the speaker can oh, no. so cancel that, right? Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. All right, and so um, if you were running the same thing in the browser, okay. All right, so you can see the page because the browser knows how to parse the HTML and JavaScript and also uh, render it, okay, so here in the browser. All right, so that's how it works from Curl. And then also another, another two, okay, you might need that in the future, is this Postman, okay. Where's the Postman? Anyway, this one here, all right. So if you do this, is this a nicer interface for you to interact with? All right, so I can uh, try a new one here. It's a request. All right, and then I can type www.cpp.edu. I send that one here, and I can also get all these responses from here. Okay, so just a better UI for you to specify the URL and see the result, all the headers, make some changes. So you might need this uh, postman if you do a lot of HTTP requests in your app, okay? So these are just giving you some kind of ideas on what's going on in HTTP, and it's really not hard because um, you, know, you can use all the tools to, to get it, or you can just use the browser to get it. All of those works, okay? <clears throat> but for our case, we're talking about a mobile development, then you need to figure out how to do this request from a mobile device, okay? All I'm showing you are the tools, the browsers, but now what you need to do is make the same kind of request for mo through mobile and then use the response. So that's what we're on focus. All right, so let me give you kind of a concrete example. Okay, I'm gonna use this example since we were talking about this, this app here. It reminds me some of the uh, API you can do from Google. So for example, in Google Map, you know, you can get all the travel distance in time, the traffic set, all of those. In fact, you can also do your own Google Map because they, they gave you all the APIs. Okay, so I think it's called, uh, let, me, let me find it for you. Google <coughs> Map and API. This is something I was playing around with yesterday. So this thing called a distance matrix API. Okay, so this one, uh, you can look at the documentation, pretty straightforward to use. And also it's all HTTP based, which means that you can use this uh, link, 
the URL to, to send the request. Very easy to use, okay? So this one gave you a lot of pre, uh, good things that you can specify the original address and then destination and you can then get the distance and travel time. You can also do some other things like uh, you can specify the mode, which is uh, driving, walking, the one you're using in a Google Map app. You can specify the region. You can say avoid the toll road, units, miles, or kilometers, arrival time, departure time, traffic mode, uh, transition mode, all of those. Okay, a lot of parameters for you to use. Let me show you how, how it works. Okay, so to use this app uh, API, you have to register a Google project and then get an API key pretty easy. There's a documentation. So anyway, once you got a key, you could, let me show you an example. Okay, so right here, you can use something like this to call the API. So let me actually add a key here. I had one project that set up. Um, all right, so I'm gonna copy this. Let me show you. Okay, so I'm gonna put this long URL. Let's not worry about what's the parameter, but let me just put that in the browser. Okay, so I can see I can get all these responses. Now response looks like we're talking about some of the destination address. So it looks like, because I'm giving a latitude and longitude. So Google is suggesting some of the address you can use for that place. And the original address is this one here. And then this one here shows the distance, driving time, and there are different distances. Maybe there are different routes, okay, using the toll road or not, something like that. So that, I guess that's, that's what happened here, okay? So, so this is the API. Okay, Google have this functionality on their server. You can interact with that server through HTTP. And then this interaction is so easy that you just put the URL and then put that into the, uh, into the browser, you can test it. Okay, so let's try something. So let's change it. So I'm gonna drive from, okay. Uh, let's try from maybe Irvine, okay. To Cal Poly Pomona. So these are the parameter you can change. Well, it looks like they give us a lot of destinations. Okay, that's why you got a lot of routes. So we don't need that. Okay, so from here, I'll do the call poly Pomona. All right, and then that's my key. So if I hit enter, all right. So as you can see, they can automatically even parse the address for you because it's already saved. And then that's the original address. So 32 miles. And then driving time is 38 minutes. Okay, so um, I don't think this duration is the actual right, the current time. And if you want to do the current time, you know, what do you need to do here if you look at documentation? Okay, so it says that uh, you can do uh, departure time, and then it will give you the actual driving time based on that departure time. So by default, it's right now. All right, let's try now, okay? So if I do this one, see if that works. I'm gonna attach another parameter equals to now, if that works, let's try that. All right, so as you can see, um, now you got a duration, that's the normal time, and also the duration in traffic. So that means the current time, the actual time if you drive right now. You can also specify if I'm gonna drive later on in two hours, you just give a timestamp and that's gonna give you the result. All right, so the 39 minutes. All right, so very simple to easy to use. This is just one example. <laughs> Sometimes you, you're doing something else. I know students used to work with some of the recipe APIs. Uh, they have some of the image search APIs. Um, whenever you see the API, that's, they must have some kind of HTTP support. It may not be as easy as this one that's just put everything into one link, but um, if, you, if you look at the documentation, there is always a the endpoint, there's always a pass. And then this is just a matter of parameters you put as a format and also some of the keys for authentication purposes, okay? So I'm gonna use this example here uh, in Flutter to show you how that works in that, okay? Uh, to give you a better idea, okay, so if we don't use Flutter, for example, if we do Python, 
And if you want to program it, it's pretty simple. Okay, so I'm going to show you a very quick example. So if I create a Python program, <clears throat> has anyone done this before? What, what library do you use for HTTP in Python? Very good. Okay, request. All right. So this one allows you to very easy to use. That's why you know Python definitely getting popular. Okay, if you do a method called a get, okay, the reason is I want to send this get request, right? So if I do this one, I simply put my URL here. All right, so that's gonna send the same request and then we can see the result. So I can save the result here. And then if you wanna see um, the actual result, it's just that simple. Okay, so if you wanna put that into an into JSON and let's run it. As you can see, same piece of information. The difference is I'm requesting here from the browser. The browser sent the HTTP request. Now I'm using Python to send the request, but I got the same result because I'm talking to the same server, following the same protocol. And then if you want to also use a curl, you're going to get exactly the same result. If I go back here, if I do this one, um, I thought I had that one. Yeah, anyway, maybe, maybe they, they don't allow you, maybe when I do this one here, I don't have the headers, so they, they think that's not a real request, so they, they reject it, but uh, looks like here it works. Okay, so this one still works, but anyway, it's just the same request that you can do from different places. Okay, so that's how the Python works. Uh, let's do a little bit more. Okay, so if you got this one in Python, um, then how do we access the data? So you probably already, I assume most of you already know this is called JSON, right? A very typical data format they use in the web, server, everything. And so the reason this one is so popular because the format is very concise. Uh, in the old days, people use XML, <coughs> a lot of tags very hard to manage. Sometimes you miss the tags. This one, they don't use the tag, they just use the brackets. And also the bracket tell you a lot of information. If you see this kind of bracket, you know this is a list. If you see this kind of bracket, that's just a typical object. And then you got value, sorry, key and value, left and right. The, va the key tells you the meaning, the value gives you the actual data. So that's why this format is so popular, okay? Um, but my question is how do we access it? For example, right now I want to know I just want to know this distance. I just want to know the actual travel time. And then in Python, how do we access that? Anyone done that? Um. All right, so it's actually quite easy. So um, if you if we save this whole result, I actually don't know if uh, this is a string. Uh, it's not a string. It probably is a map or a dictionary or something like that. Okay, so you can try this. Okay, you can try to do. Uh, I think it's dictionary. Okay, uh, but I, I I can't be certain, so I'm not too expert on Python. I know how to use that. Oh, you can try the type, right? Okay, so let's test it. So once you do this, okay, so it is a dictionary. So, so if a dictionary, then you can then access all the attributes. For example, if I want to get the destination, <coughs> so I can just get this attribute, all right? So I can then do this one here, all right? So that's how you can grab that just one attribute. So if I run it, it's just gonna give me that little uh, address here. But remember, this is a list, okay? If you wanna really know that, that place, then you gotta get at least this one here to get the first element, all right? So very easy to operate, right? So if we, you know, in this case, I wanna get this 32 miles, okay? So this one is under rows, okay? So I gotta go back here, look at rows, and then uh, the rows, remember, this is the list, okay? So there is, even though there's only one item, but it is a list. So you gotta choose that list item first. So it's a zero. And then you got elements. 
All right, let's just test it, make sure it works. Now, when I do this, as you can see, I only got this distance, all this part, so which is right here. I'm getting this part here. Again, this is a list. As you can see, this bracket. So I'm actually interested in just the first one. This, this whole thing is one item. So I elements zero, the first one, and then I'm just getting this distance. All right, so if I run this again, tell me the tax and the value. I don't care about this value, I just care about the tax. So I do this one here, run one more time. All right, I got 32 miles. Same way, if you want to get uh, the travel time, okay, so this one. Duration in traffic, this is the actual time, this is the normal time. So all I need to do is change this one into this, run it again. All right, 40 minutes. So that's how you operate the response in JSON in Python. This is really, really easy. Um, it doesn't check all the types, uh, but it, it's just so easy to, to access and manipulate the data. Um, back in Java, you, you, you can't do this. In Java, you have to build a full class to map it. Um, it's safer, but it's, it takes you more time to do all of this. Okay, so um, Python really make all of this really simple. Uh, like this one line of code, and this one, you can't really do that with two lines in Java. Okay, you gotta have a little, like a, I'm not seeing a, a big method, but a mid-sized method to do all of this. Besides, you know, capturing all the exceptions, all of those, importing all the uh, libraries. So that's why Python getting popular. However, um, I, I wouldn't say that Python is gonna replace Java because uh, in production code, you probably can't just do something like this, okay? It's, it's very good for you to prototyping and testing things, but Java, on the other hand, is more reliable, safer. All the type checking, all of those. I'm sure Python, you can also do the same thing, but, um, but Java has its, its own advantages, all right? So anyway, that's how things happen in, in um, uh, Python. Okay, now it's time to go back to our app. All right, so let me run my app first. Uh, we gotta get a new screen here for us to use. Last time I was showing the list of you, and then uh, let's get uh, something really simple, just some kind of a text here, okay? Uh, so I'm gonna change something here. All right, so I'm gonna put some text. All right, so the text is gonna contain some hard-coded values. So, so, so the driving my uh, commute. So total distance. Current time. All right, something like this. This is two parameters, okay? So coming back here, that's the example we did last time. If I refresh it, all right, so that's that. And then let's just uh, align some of those, I guess we can do a center. All right. All right, something like this, very simple. All, all I need is to just kind of display the number, the same API I just showed you. All right, so let's see how that works. So in um, Flutter, okay, to get HTTP request, you're gonna use this library called HTTP, okay? So they have a very nice tutorial right here. So if you Google uh, Flutter HTTP, you will be able to find it. It's actually the first, actually the second one, fetch data from internet. So this is a much better uh, tutorial, okay? It's very concise and then it's not difficult at all. Okay, so you start with adding a package, just like in Python, you need to do this import request. So we need this thing called HTTP package. Uh, I think this is the first time we added package, okay? So you, when you need a dependency, okay, go to this YAML file, okay? Public specification, that file, open this one here. We changed this one before when we're adding the asset files. Now if we're adding the dependencies, you need, you need to come here again. So you can see there is this one field called dependencies. 
Uh, remember, there are the dependencies, also a dev dependencies. I didn't look too much. The difference, I guess, is this one is only exists for a dev environment. Maybe test, a very typical use case is for testing purposes, you probably have some extra dependencies, but when you build the final release app, you don't need those, okay? So that's why you, have, you got a tool. But normally, let's just put it to the dependency and make sure this library is always available. You put it here. Also, I think that indentation matters here, okay? So you can do this one. If you do this one, I think somehow it, it, it says that this one belongs to the Flutter, which won't work. So it actually go to the first level. And then you specify a version, okay? The version of the dependency, you go here, the latest version, you can find it, then you can see it here from this uh, uh, repository. I think that's the version number right here. You can use this one. All right. So once you add this dependency, make sure you download the dependency. Okay, so go here, and you can see whenever you change something, this button will pop up. To get the package, you click on that. It's gonna download that package for you and then save that to the project. So it's done. not really a big project, a uh, dependency. All right, so now let's go back to here, and then let's try to make a HTTP request. All right, so I'm gonna test that with just a method. Okay, so in this class here, okay, I'm gonna build a new method. Let's also make it a private. I'll, I'll call it like a get travel uh, status. All right, from there you need to use HTTP. All right, so let's go back here. So take a look at the tutorial, that's step one. So you gotta import this package in your code. Let's put it here. All right, and then this is how you can actually send the HTTP get request. If you look at this method, it's really simple. This one is almost the same as the Python approach. Very easy, HTTP.get. And then later on, if you do post, then you do dot post. So this is called a modern program. Okay, so that's what the program is supposed to work with. If you just wanna do the request, this is the simplest way to, to do it. One parameter, just a URL and the method here, very short, this is really good. That's why they don't really use Java, C++ for the Flutter because those languages are too much, too heavy. So they want something really uh, concise and, and easy to use. Okay, let's try it. So. HTTP dot get and then put the URL. Okay, so we're gonna do the same URL. Alright, that's it. Alright, so you you can send this request. Now once you send the request then you need to know how to deal with the, the response. Now in Python, it's really easy. You, you receive the response like this, and then you use this manipulated data. That's very straightforward, okay? But unfortunately, you can't do this kind of a simple thing in, in, uh, in Flutter. Uh, it's not because the, the Dart is not as good as Python. <coughs> the, the reason is uh, you're dealing with a mobile device, and then there is something special you need to consider compared with this one here. Okay, I'm gonna dive into that a little bit later. But let me see the, the tutorial first um, to tell you how to do it, okay? So, they, if you look at documentation, okay, this re method returns you some kind of response, HTTP response, very typical. That's what the, also the Python did. But then a little bit different thing here, there is a future here wrapping this response, okay? So you can see this one returns the future that contains a response, okay? So this future is a very important concept you need to know, okay? Um, whenever you're dealing with the network communication, back in server side, the APIs, SDKs, very likely in Flutter, you will need to use this future. Okay, some of you probably already done this. Um, this keyword basically tell you this very simple concept, uh, which is called asynchronized call or asynchronized communication. All right, so that's what the future is used for. Different languages have a different way to handle it. Java or Android also have the same kind of maximum, but they don't use future. So anyway, let me just show you how this thing works first, and then we'll come back to talk more about this future. So if this response is a future, as you can see, that's um, basically the, the response. If I, I write this full line here, okay, it's gonna be look like this, future, and then the type is http.response. 
okay i can call this response something like this so that's what that one returns for you okay so and then if i want to for example just like python if i want to print out this this thing here if i just print it something like this let's see what happened all right so i'm going to call this method in the one thing you can do is in the constructor okay you could actually make a constructor And then you can call this method right here. So whenever you open the screen, you can do it. Let me put a message here, loading the current driving travel status. All right, so we do this one. Let me refresh my code. Okay, so Okay, so but one thing to remember, if you put this thing into the constructor, Whenever you uh, load the hot load this app here, it won't trigger the constructor. Okay, you gotta go back and and then um, run it again. Okay, so let me see if you let me just restart it. Okay, if I really click on this button and then run the app, it's gonna work. Okay, that's a different testing I would get. Uh, let me just show you this one. Here. <clears throat> So it doesn't trigger it. Um, All right, so as you can see, why this one does so many times? Wait, why, why does this one does so many times? Oh, sorry, sorry, I did this wrong. It's a, uh, this one is a load. Um, load, wait, what's the master name? Get. All right, so basically here, uh, when I refresh it, it loads the status right here and then call this method and then it print out this future response, okay? So that's kind of similar to uh, what we did before. Now, um, let me show you something more, okay? So here, I will say start the request. Request then okay you know let me let me just uh, add a button because uh refreshing this one won't work so let me just add a button here to trigger it okay so let's bring a button
Okay, so I'm, this time I'm gonna click on this button. It's gonna trigger the HTTP, okay? Let, let's see what happens. And when I click, all right, so instantly send the, send the request and then it's done and then you, you try to print out the, the, the response. Okay, let me try this again. Click, it's done instantly, okay? So uh, what I'm trying to show you right now is, I don't know if you see something weird because if you go back here, if I run this code, how much time it takes. Okay, so this one here, Let, let's try this. Start. Done. Okay, so let's run this again. As you can see, the start and then there is a little bit gap. Okay, then you try to try one more time. Start, done. So this is the kind of a typical uh, HTTP request because you are sending this thing to to Google server. Um, we're very close to Google server. Google server has very good performance. So it's not doesn't take too long, but you can see there is a, a time, uh, you know, a, a request time. You know, maybe five hundred milliseconds, half seconds. But here in Flutter, when you click on a button, it's instant, okay? So what happens here? So that's a little concept you need to know here, which is called a uh, asynchronized, okay? So when you click on a button, this line here does send a request, okay? Now, if this thing here give you a future, okay, that means the code, it goes to this line, get to this line, if this is the future, then Flutter or Dart is not gonna wait on this call here. Where in Python, you are actually waiting on this line. So this is the get, we run it, we're gonna wait. When I get the response, I'm done, and then I move on to here, I can print everything. Where in further, you do not wait. You get here, sending get, it takes some, I know it's slow, but that's okay, I wanna move on. So that's why you see this line right away, and then you see this line right away. So the response is not gonna give you anything at that point, because very likely the response has not come back yet. Okay? So this kind of future maximum is called asynchronized call, okay? It means that we are gonna use this uh, kind of, uh, uh, we don't wanna wait you. I'm, I still wanna do my thing. You go ahead to fetch and then do your work. Then if you're done, let me know. I can take care of the rest. Okay, so let me finish the code to tell you how that works. So if you got this future, I can do this. Response dot, the very first method called Zen. That means if, if you got this response, then what do you want to do? Okay, so I'm gonna, I have put the method, because you can see this one take a parameter called value, which is the response, I'm gonna call, I would just call it response. And then there's a little method that you can process, you can print response right here. Or let me separate that, I, I will say that. Okay, received response. All right. And I can also do something else called catch error. So if something is wrong, I will say failed to get the response. All right, so let's see what happened this time. So I'm gonna refresh. Click on the button, send the response, and then I'm gonna wait. If I got a response, I'm gonna print this message here. So click. So you can see, this time it's a little bit different. Okay, so start a request, you also see that little pause, right? Let me, let me show you again. Sending, and then receive the response. A little bit, little bit uh, let, me, let me actually deal this line here, okay? So it's a little confusing. Click on the button, send, receive. Send, receive, about like one second, half seconds. Okay, so, this line of code here, the received response, is not gonna be executed um, until you, you get a response. So that's how this future works, okay? Um, because we do not want the app to wait on, on your um, communication. 
The reason is in the mobile devices, this is something really bad to have. You know, you want your mobile app to be very, very smooth. Every click, you're gonna get a response. If you have to wait, show you some kind of progress bar or, or, or just come back later, but we don't want to stuck on your on on the mobile app that the, the screen is frozen. That's a very bad experience. In fact, a lot of the, for example, Android, they have a requirement. If your app is doing something more than two seconds or three seconds, automatically pop up this little dialogue to say that this app is still waiting. Do you want to wait or do you want to close? Because that's a very bad experience. So you shouldn't have that happen. Everything shouldn't wait on some of this long time process. That's why when you do this to be here, you need to do this kind of asynchronized way. Uh, that's what this HTTP gives you, right? So if you understand all of this, I'm, I'm gonna simplify this a little bit, okay? I'm gonna do this. Whenever you do the HTTP request, you can do HTTP.get, and then you can say, if this is successful, please do this block. If this is not successful, please do this one. That's it. And you're gonna see this kind of structure a lot. And then from here, we could print out the result. Okay, so fail to get the response. So I'm gonna delete this part here, okay? All right, now the response has two things. There's a status code, the 200 code, or there is a body. The body will have the actual JSON thing. Okay, so I'm gonna refresh this, come back, click on load. As you can see, now I got exactly the same thing, just like Python. So the whole thing works just like Python, the difference is we are using the asynchronous call, which means you have to specify this kind of a callback method. What do you wanna do if you receive it? What do you wanna do if you don't receive it? Once you got a body, you can also uh, parse it. Okay, so here, the code will show you how you do the parsing. There are different approaches. Uh, this is a more formal way. There should be a simple, simpler way to do this. Some, some uh, convert this thing here. Okay, let me show you. So there is a library, convert, and then you can, uh, because you receive this uh, whole body as a JSON string, this is a string. So you can, you can specify, uh, you know, the actual object, which is, uh, JSON decode. Okay, so something like this. All right, and then you got this object. I think from the object, you will be able to do the same thing just like uh, Python. Okay, so for example, let's try this. I'm gonna do the destination address. Okay, refresh. This time I'm gonna click on data and that just show me that that's the address. Okay, when you get this part here, it works exactly like Python. It's like a map. Uh, in, in Dart, it doesn't call it dictionary, it's called map. Okay, string and an object, that kind of map. So you can always fetch those attributes, All right? So if we do the same thing, um, if I wanna get the time, I think we might just copy the same thing here. Okay, so I will just copy the same part here because it all works like in the same way. And then the other one, you do origin and traffic. Refresh, go back, click on this one to load it. And then you got the miles and minutes. All right, so that's the data you want. So once you, again, once you got this body here, edit the screen, you use the JSON decode. This is the built-in method, but you need to import this library called convert, start convert, convert string into the JSON object, okay? So this one here is actually a map, okay? It's a kind of map from a string to something called a dynamic. Dynamic is just like a node type, okay? So it's, that's how you can understand it. So that's why you can then just grab all the keys, sorry, go grab all the values using the keys. If this is a list, you can use a list, and that's how it works, all right? So once you have this, the rest part will be really, really easy because of further, how, the, how they handle the data synchronization. Remember, all I need to do is specify some state. So we can do a, a distance. We can do a time.
right? So these are the state. Then you can use that in your here. In the beginning, it's just like this empty. And then if you got the actual data, all you need to do is replace this one with actual data. All right, and then you refresh, go back here, click on the button, you got the response, not, not updated. What's missing here? Sorry, I, I heard something. What was set states, right? So if you want to tell further, my data got changed, whoever is using this data on your UI, please update it. Now mark this one into set state. Let's try one more time. Okay, this time click on the oh, it's actually already happened. Um yeah, but it's maybe because of hot load, all right? So, oh, because I call this in the constructor, I guess. Yeah, I have this line here. So I, if I delete that one. And anyway, so you click on this button, it's gonna change. All right, so for example, I try, uh, let me try a different thing here um, from uh, San Jose, okay, I do that one. So I click on the button. So 366 miles and six hours. <coughs> All right. Does that data come from Google server? See how simple it is. Okay, I have to say that this whole part here, writing the code, if you understand everything, is five, five times faster than Android. Okay, if you do Android, you do a lot more work. Uh, now the HTTP got simpler, <coughs> parsing got simpler. More importantly, this whole UI synchronization also is simpler. Okay, so the further is agreed to what? The more I do it, uh, I can see the big potential um, about it. You can actually start to Google about people's comment on Flutter. Uh, it's gonna be, I think it's gonna be, gonna be huge because it's not just gonna be mobile, it's also web. All right, or maybe later on desktop, even though nobody really needed desktop, but mobile and web, those are enough. So I think the React is gonna have a big you know, competition uh, from, from Flutter. Okay. Different people have different opinions. For me, I think the syntax here, if you're familiar with Java, this is a better than JavaScript, than ReactJS. That, that's just my personal opinion, okay? Uh, definitely worth some time to, to, to try all of this, all right? So anyway, uh, that's how HTTP works, okay? So most of the things you can actually find from this little tutorial right here. Um, they also told you how you can map this thing to the class. Um, I personally don't think that's really needed. If you already know the format, if you know the format is not changing, um, Building this one, mapping it, it gives you better types, but it's not required. Okay, we'll give you more example next time. All right, uh, but the, this one, I just want to show you how you talk to the HTTP. If your app needs some HTTP API, you can just use this. Most of your app probably will need your own server. That's going to need uh, Firebase. So we'll talk about that next one, next week. All right, um, any questions? Okay, very cool. All right, I will see you next week.